Hello everyone, my name is PJ and welcome to The Void. So I've decided to do more videos where I review multiple games at once. Believe it or not, there isn't much difference in workload between a 5 minute video and a 30 minute video. And since my longer videos are the ones getting more views, this should make things more fun for everyone. Today we'll be following up on my review of The Neverhood and talking about all four of its spin-off games. Each one is bizarre in its own ways and have different levels of quality. All but one of them use real claymation and were made by series creator Doug Tenable, who I never mentioned before is also the creator of the Earthworm Jim series. And Earthworm Jim was also a clay fighter at one point. Wait a minute. Earthworm Jim, clay, never, Doug Tenable, what? Anyway, Doug also worked with composer Terry Scott Taylor on the same games, and for the most part, his other OSTs did not disappoint. Let's dive in, shall we? First, let's talk about the only true sequel to The Neverhood, Skull Monkeys on the PS1. Why did they make a console-exclusive sequel to a PC-exclusive game? Well, that wasn't the only series at the time to do so. I don't know what was going on. Unlike The Neverhood, which was a point-and-click adventure with puzzles and an open world, Skull Monkeys is a level-by-level -level 2D platformer. In fact, only two of the five Neverhood games are point-and-clicks. The rest are all different genres entirely. Another bizarre fact to add to the list. Skull Monkeys is also the only game that I own a physical copy of, and it happens to be one of the rarer variants with the holographic cover. These things go for pretty steep prices on eBay, and I got mine for only 25 cents at a yard sale, because yard sales are the tits. The story picks up exactly where the Neverhood ended, with Clog being ejected from the planet into the void beyond. He eventually crash lands on the planet Idznak, which was made by one of Quator's other sons, and without dying somehow, he just immediately proceeds to rip off a native's head and skin and wear them, proclaiming himself King of the Skull Monkeys. Naturally, the normally peaceful natives are scared shitless by Glog and agree to follow his orders. He tells them to construct a giant war machine with which to destroy the Neverhood. One of the more intelligent Skull Monkeys quickly uses a device to find and kidnap the closest hero to come save them. And that hero is Clayman. Right away, the quality of Taylor's OST is made perfectly clear. I love this game's soundtrack almost as much as the Neverhoods, and it's definitely got the second best OST of the five games. One of the songs is actually just a choir singing the name of the level over and over. And, I shit you not, Skull Monkeys is probably the only video game whose OST has a cover of Beans Beans. There is one more song, probably the most famous song in the franchise that I'll need to talk about, but not today. I'm just gonna do another video dedicated to my favorite Neverhood songs. It needs to be heard to be believed. Stages are divided into acts, and more and more of a level's theme song is revealed as you progress through them. Unfortunately, there is one level where they forgot to loop the music. Nearly perfect. The graphics of this game are handled in much the same way as the first. Character models and settings are built out of real clay, filmed, and then turned into sprites. Unfortunately, this leads to many of the same graphical issues the first game had. Sprites are very artifacted with pixelated edges and the backgrounds look like badly compressed JPEGs. The first levels of this game are painfully simple. Easy enemies, easy jumps, collectibles everywhere feels almost like a kid's game but it very quickly becomes very difficult. 
Controlling Clayman takes some getting used to. When you tap left or right as lightly as you can, he moves a fixed distance ahead, like he's moving on a grid. He jumps the same way too, and this can make his movements feel very slippery. Level 10 and the final level have some of the most difficult and precise platforming I have ever encountered. The last level is particularly hard and has these platforms that quickly move up and down. If you jump while they're going down, your jump will be shorter and you'll die. If you jump while going up, your jump will be higher depending on when during your ascent you jumped. And if you don't get your timing just right, you'll miss your mark and die. Even if you master the timing for these, you also have to get used to the game's shoddy edge detection. You'd think that since Clayman moves on a grid, it'd be harder to fall off, but it's actually easier. You get a number of power-ups throughout the game, including extra hit halos, which are extremely rare, and hundreds of clay balls that give you extra lives. You can summon a... Fart clone that scouts ahead and acts as an extra hit of sorts. If it survives long enough, the real Clayman will magically take its place. Unfortunately, you cannot use it to solve puzzles more easily, as you can't summon a clone while standing on a pressure plate. There's also a power-up that destroys all enemies on screen, and even one where you can summon... Oh, shit! Me! Willy Drumbo! No, no, get out! Oh, come out, on! Out, Don't be out, a square, I'm not man. dealing with this not shit cool, today. Bro. You also get a finite number of shots that you can attack enemies with, but the active HUD doesn't display your ammo count, you have to pause the game to see it. You're also not allowed to set your own control scheme, you're forced to use predetermined allocations and you can't change them mid-game. When you lose all your lives, you get game over, lose your mid-stage checkpoints, and have to start at the beginning of the act. Not too bad, at least it's not from the beginning of the whole level. This game does not feature saves, instead choosing to use a relatively simple password system. There are even special passwords that let you visit normally inaccessible stages, like stage 0. However, if you ever use a password to continue from where you left off, you lose all your unique pickups and forfeit the secret ending. The passwords don't save them. You have to get all the way to the end of the game in one sitting and without getting a game over and while getting every single special collectible in order to see the secret ending, which isn't even worth it. In the game's normal ending, you defeat Clog, destroy his war machine and save the Neverhood, but Clayman is left to float aimlessly through space, his fate left up in the air. Naturally, you'd assume the secret ending will elaborate on or change Clayman's fate, saving him or something. But no, instead, you get... Clog is dead and we want to celebrate it. He's pushing up daisies and form rambling. Bad guy ask why we're related. Well, Clog is dead. Follow the bouncing skull. Yes, Clog's kaput. A musical number that assures the audience that everyone's favorite Neverhood villain is most definitely dead. After only two games, they killed off the main antagonist, and this secret ending doesn't change Clayman's fate at all. It's still a cliffhanger, one that was never resolved in any of the other games. And that's something that's always pissed me off about some games, is their cliffhanger endings. If you cannot guarantee that there will be another game that picks up the cliffhanger, don't end with one. Lastly, the bosses in the game are kind of a mixed bag. The first boss is too easy, the fight with Clog has no music, and the second of the five bosses is the hardest in the whole game. Oh, that I suppose I should show you that boss, huh? Brace yourself. So while it is a fun game with great music, it's just aggravating enough that I don't really want to play it a second time trying to get the secret ending for myself. That and the story is utter nonsense. Most of the cutscenes are just non sequitur gags that don't advance the plot. Why are you whistling, Clayman? 
You don't know what women are. Overall, I give Skull Monkeys a 6 out of 10. Same as the Neverhood's current score. Don't get me wrong, Skull Monkeys is probably my second favorite game in the series, but that just means it's all downhill from here. The third game, Boombots, is a 3D arena-based arcade fighter for the PS1 and the first entry to use 3D models, though the cutscenes are still made using claymation. Though it is most assuredly part of the Neverhood franchise, its story and setting have nothing to do with the Neverhood itself, at least not at first glance. This is a very fast-paced game that focuses more on mastering your environment than beating your opponent into submission. Every character gets the same setup of attacks, including a grab, a weak melee attack that also functions as a counter to grabs and projectiles, a machine gun, and two kinds of missiles. They can dash around, double jump or hover, and fire powerful shockwaves when their special meter is full. And no, there are no stupid half circle, hit A and R, the same frame perfect moment impossible to pull off combos like in traditional fighters. It's just you, your basic attacks, and the one or two things that make your character unique. It's easy for anyone to pick up and play, but god is it hard. I died in the first fight over and over and over before learning all the mechanics. There are no difficulty settings, there is no timer to abuse, and every battle is one bout. There's no way to make it easier, you just have to get good. One easy way to plot out the first half of the story mode is to just spam grab attacks. The early enemies aren't smart enough to cancel out of it, but by the end they will almost always escape. There is a lot to keep track of in these fights. You have to collect all the power-ups as they appear not only for your own use, but to keep the opponent from using them. You have to deflect their projectiles by parrying them with melee attacks, as well as any of your projectiles to the back at you, all while running around in a similar fashion to the game Tanks, avoiding enemy fire while also platforming around a 3D environment. It's incredibly intense. And fun, too. The setting of Boombots is actually Earth, a few million years in the future. The world has been taken over by an empire of alien cats, so a roboticist named Dr. Pick creates the Boombots, a small team of robots themed after various racist and sexist stereotypes to combat them. You probably just thought to yourself, wait, what? Yes, for some reason, almost all of the Boombots are horribly offensive and bland stereotypes. There's Hans, the Texas Ranger. Y'all come on back, you hear? Hara Hara, the Japanese Mantis. A Scottish airplane named... Airplane. Boomer, the main character, is a testosterone-fueled brutish male. Bring it on, punk! And Chicky Boom, the only initially playable female, has a visible underside to her skirt and jiggle physics. I repeat, the completely steel, low-poly robot has jiggle physics. Normally, I'd be like, cool, she's a sexy robot, but she's one of those walking paradoxes who's supposed to be a symbol of female empowerment but all she does is bring constant attention to the fact that she's a woman and therefore shouldn't be able to accomplish the things she has. By a girl. Uh. Luckily, the game has two better strong female characters that you can unlock, including Lady Wasp and a hawking hockey player named O Canada. There are also inoffensive characters like a robot dog and a generically evil robot. Not much to say about them. The way to unlock characters in this game is pretty simple. You have to reach certain points of the story completely undefeated and then defeat the secret characters that pop up to unlock them. Given the game's difficulty, this would be impossible if not for one very generous feature, the ability to save after every fight. So if you lose a fight, all you have to do is quit and load your save and you can retain your undefeated status and unlock everything in a single playthrough. And a single playthrough is all you need. Since the cutscenes don't change with the character you pick, they're all about Boomer and the aliens. And while most of them are funny, you can just skip them on subsequent playthroughs. So little effort went into these written sections with Dr. Pick that he actually claims to have created your character no matter who you choose. Even if you pick a non-robot, like the evil cat alien's leader, 
or a character that we know for absolute certain he did not create, Clayman. Yes, Clayman is an unlockable character in this game, and his attacks are all based on ones he used in Skull Monkeys. The Neverhood is his stage, but it is unfortunately the blandest and most boring stage in the entire game, with no platforms or hazards. Every 3D fighting game with diverse arenas has one like this, but it's a shame that it ended up being the Neverhood in this game. Speaking of disappointment, the OST for Boombots is the worst one out of all the games Taylor worked on. For starters, it's way too small. There's like six songs in the whole game, including the audio for a bonus FMV at the end. It's so short that it actually shares a disc with the Skull Monkeys OST. And what's more, none of the songs in this game are particularly memorable. It all feels very phoned in. In the end, I'm going to give this game a 5 out of 10. The OST is bad, the graphics are okay, I can't say much about the manual since I don't own it and can't find a PDF, but the gameplay itself is pretty solid, and it's worth playing to completion once just to unlock all the characters and see all the cool claymation scenes. It doesn't have a lot of replayability though, unless you can find a friend to play versus mode with. This next game is by far the black sheep of the Neverhood flock. While it is an officially licensed Neverhood game, it did not involve Doug Tenaple, Terry Scott Taylor, Neverhood Inc., or DreamWorks Interactive. I don't know how it managed to get made. Kreiman Ganhoke, or Clayman Gunhockey, is a PS1 game made by River Hill Soft and released exclusively in Japan. It's an arcade-style sports game based on air hockey, but instead of using paddles, you knock the puck around using guns. Which is such a bizarre concept, since this is clearly meant to be a little kid's game. The music is so generically cheery and I'm almost certain it's stuck. There's a bright blue sky in the Neverhood. There's no sky in the Neverhood, it's supposed to be in the void. Oh. That's how you keep getting here. That really should have occurred to me earlier. What's more, none of the dialogue in the game uses kanji. It's all written in kana, making it easier to read for Japanese children and those learning the language. The cutscenes are all still 2D images, and the only animations are during hockey matches, where characters like Willy, Hoborg, Clog, and the Weasel, who is a character for some reason, are rendered in 3D instead of clay. There are no claymation cutscenes in this game. It was made on a budget of less than 10,000 yen, which is about 95 US dollars. There are indie games with much higher budgets than that. So, how does it play? Well, for starters, you don't have to aim. Your gun automatically targets the puck. All you have to do is shoot. Scattered around the playing field are power-ups you can collect if you knock the puck into them, the only reason to attempt aiming. Some power-ups do simple things like change the speed of the puck, or provide a temporary barrier for your goal. The most notable power-up is the one that multiplies the puck, instantly turning your game into a chaotic mess. Your gun can only target one puck at a time, so it's not going to deflect them all. I find the most effective strategy is to get the wall power-up, then wait for the AI to multiply the puck. I activate the wall, and the opponent is left to deal with the ensuing madness. Of course, this only works when the puck can actually get into the opponent's goal. I swear, I am bouncing this puck into his goal over and over, and it's not going in. God damn it, really? <laughs> this game is pretty much all luck. You can't win if the AI decides to perfectly defend their goal, and you lose in the event of a tie. I actually won one of the matches on my first try by staying perfectly still and mashing the fire button. Didn't even use any power-ups, but my rematch with Willy went on for over half an hour. I hate this game. 2 out of 10. Don't play it. At this point, the Neverhood franchise died. With every game being worse than the last, it just couldn't climb back out of its hole. Ten years later, a Neverhood movie was planned with Frederator Studios behind the wheel. It was going to have a $10 million budget, but it was ultimately cancelled. Hope was not lost, however. Even though the Neverhood property is owned by EA, Dunk to Naple was determined to bring his vision back to life. And he did so through Kickstarter. In 
In 2015, Duncan Apel and Terry Scott Taylor returned to make another Neverhood styled game, but couldn't use any of the characters or locales from the Neverhood. So there's no Clayman, no Willy, thank fucking god, no Hoborg. Instead, it uses all new characters that serve as reflections of their original counterparts. Right from the start, this game looks amazing, especially compared to the original Neverhood. The resolution is higher, the frame rate is higher, creatures and environments have more detail, sprites don't have jagged edges. It's beautiful, but Tommy Knot still has that issue with the sprite being flipped. I almost feel like they did that on purpose. Armacrog is the first game in the series since the original Neverhood to be a point and click adventure and uses the exact same controls. No keyboard, just a mouse. But this time you have a new mechanic, the ability to switch between the main character Tominot and his colorblind sidekick Beak Beak. There are certain areas that only Beak Beak is able to access and objects that are too heavy for him to push so you must alternate between the two to solve the game's puzzles. The story begins with you crash landing on the planet Spyro 5, sent by your planet's elders to find a rare energy source called Petonium. Your brothers, Vognaut and Numnaut, were sent before you, but are presumed dead since they never returned. When you arrive, you are assaulted by an alien creature, a nod to the weasel, and chased into a building. This building is the fortress Armagrog. Not much of a fortress if I can just walk to the front door. And this is where the game begins. A bit later, after solving a few puzzles, Tommy and Beaky find an abandoned baby, or someone that looks like a baby, who introduces herself with the only word she knows. P. P? Okay. Tommy then cares for the baby for the next half of the game until she is kidnapped by a corrupted Vognaut, who is not only still alive, but also responsible for the death of P's parents. P is capable of producing Petonium with her laughter, a power Vognaut intends to extract from her through force, and in an attempt to protect her, Beak Beak is killed. Now alone, Tommy has to backtrack to the entire game world a second time in order to find the clues to the final puzzle, and you have to do this your first time playing because it arbitrarily blocks the way back right before Beak Beak dies which is completely pointless since you have to watch that scene to get the last crystal. And there's this sad, sappy music playing the whole time because Beaky is no longer with you. I'm sorry, but even though Beak Beak was an okay character and he's voiced by Rob Paulson? Goddamn. He wasn't around long enough for me to develop any kind of emotional attachment. This whole stretch of the game only exists to get cheap feels from the audience. And since you can navigate the fortress just fine by yourself now, it makes it feel like Tommy literally does not need Beaky anymore. After the incredibly boring and musicless final puzzle was solved, Vognaut shows up, you defeat him, and then Beak Beak comes back as a ghost, completely nullifying any impact his death should have had. And then the credits roll. When me and my friend Tyler finished this game, we both just sat there and said, that was lame. It felt so anticlimactic, and almost everything in the game is just a repeat of what happened in the Neverhood. Tommy, Numb, and Vogue are direct parallels to Clayman, Willie, and Clog. The important parts of the story are explained in 2D animated cutscenes, just like with Willie's tapes. There's the weasel parallel, wall-mounted gondolas, and even a giant robot. Vog, like Clog before him, grew claws and transformed into a monster by pure greed, which is exactly how it's explained in the game. I think we're supposed to just accept the idea that this is what happens to clay people when they become greedy. He even does what Clog did and starts claiming random things as his own. The main villain kills your sidekick in both games, and both times they are brought back in the ending. Vogue even uses the same jagged knife that Clog does. What? Why? Why is he just a lame copy of Clog? He's not even funny like Clog was, nor is he as intimidating. Vognaut's motivations and backstory are never explained during the game, and it frustrated me because I felt like either I missed something important or the writing was extremely lazy. Well, I didn't want a repeat of the FF11 incident, so I did more research before writing this review. And part of that was... Reading the new Wall of Lore. Yes, the Wall of Text from the first game returns. So I set aside two hours and read the whole thing. Because I was desperate for answers. And it was 
actually really fascinating. It tells this amazing love story about P's former guardians who escaped their previous lives, ran away together, got married, found P, and built Armacrog in order to defend themselves from their pursuers. It's full of original lore about an alien culture and it explains how clay people reproduce. It was a very good read. Too bad it still doesn't explain what happened to Vognaut. It does, however, make Beak Beak's death more tolerable by explaining that everyone who tries to defend P by those who would abuse her power is cursed to die. P's former guardians died protecting her from Vognaut, and her guardians before that starved to death. The Wall of Lore is actually integral to the main story this time, but that just makes it worse. It means that players have to stop playing the game for two hours in order to read this wall, or the ending won't make as much sense. And you have to read it when you find it, because if you progress past this point, it will soon become inaccessible. So if you were hoping to come back and read it after beating the game, tough shit. You have to either start a new game and get back to this point, or read it online somewhere. Doug Tenable what were you thinking? This is not how you handle lore in video games. I can't believe you made the same mistake twice. In other lore-rich games like Dark Souls or The Elder Scrolls, the lore is scattered around the world in books and item descriptions. The story is dotted. This is clamped together. I have to reiterate the same point I made about the Neverhood story. Clearly there is some heart and hard work put into this, but the implementation of the story is very poor. <sighs> and I'm not even done talking about this game yet. That was all just me bitching about the story. Moving on, let's talk about Terry S. Taylor's OST for this game. The soundtrack contains only 19 songs, less than half of the size of the Neverhoods, and only 15 of those songs are actually in the game. I suppose it's an appropriate size given the game's length, that being 4 hours, but it still feels like a downgrade. And even though Armacrog's OST is pretty decent and that theme song kicks ass, most of it doesn't feel like never heard of music. I get that 15 years is a long time and an artist's style can change drastically during such a gap, but my point is that the OST makes the game feel less like a never heard entry. The puzzles. Naturally, the entire game is puzzles, but it almost feels like they ran out of ideas at one point because there are two different puzzles that you have to solve thrice each. There's the three baby mobile puzzles and the three sliding puzzles. I can understand one recurring puzzle, but two? Seems unnecessary to me. There's a hint system, but unlike Willie's letters, the statues that grant these hints are everywhere. The ghost of P's former foster father guides you using cryptic hints and riddles that makes it more difficult for you to save his baby and avenge his death. Yeah, I get they don't want to just outright state the answers to puzzles for you, but this guy needs a better motivation, there's that word again, for being so coy. A common criticism of this game, on top of everything else, is the alarming number of bugs present. There are a few graphical bugs and audio bugs occur if you alt-tab. The subtitles especially bug out a lot. Sometimes they're late and sometimes they're just plain absent. The voices I don't think were recorded properly for the cutscenes. They always sound like there's an echo even when they're outside. Uh, beep beep, we'll help. The voice acting itself though is perfectly okay. I was especially impressed by the Octavators, who initially speak a completely fabricated language, something that's very difficult to voice act. So how do I feel about this game? Well, I don't feel much for it at all actually. I don't think the bad outweighs the good, but I don't think the opposite is true either. Thus I give it a 5 out of 10. And there you have it. I have reviewed every game in the Neverhood franchise. Let's see how I've tiered them up. Coincidentally, this tier list also applies to each game's OST. Number one is the Neverhood itself, with a 6 out of 10. It's not perfect, but out of all the games, I feel like it has the highest overall quality. It had the best setting, and it told the best story, with or without the Hall of Chronicles. Number two is Skull Monkeys, a really fun and super difficult platform with great music, but it's too frustrating and inconvenient at times for me to really want to play it any more than I already have. 6 out of 10. 
Number 3 is Armacrog. I really feel like Armacrog had the potential to be a great game if it weren't for the bugs and poorly handled story. 5 out of 10. Number 4 is Boombots. While this is a fun game, the fun only lasts a few minutes before it becomes overwhelmingly chaotic, and once you've unlocked everything, which doesn't take long at all, there's not much replay value. 5 out of 10. And lastly is, of course, Clayman Gun Hockey, a cheap tie-in that's supposed to be aimed at little kids, but can be completely unbeatable even for adults. Generic music, an insulting mockery of the characters and setting, and a budget on par with most Flash games, earn it a 2 out of 10. My overall thoughts on the series? Well, I feel like there was too much effort to branch out into different genres too early in its life. Most of the games are on the PS1 too, so console gamers who never even played the Neverhood didn't see much appeal in its sequels. I feel like the Neverhood should have been ported to the PS1, like it was in Japan. Every one of these games ended up being either a commercial failure or a critical failure, and in most of their cases, I consider that a shame. And keeping the fate of the Neverhood movie in mind, maybe Doug should just stick with Earthworm Jim. I hear he's working on another entry in the series anyway. Thank you so much for watching my video, and uh, I don't normally like doing this, but I'm 20 videos into this channel after almost a year and I still have less than 50 subscribers, so at least until I hit a thousand and can become a partner again, I will ask, please be sure to subscribe, leave a like, and a comment, and until next time, I'll be here, in the darkness, quietly awaiting your return. You want a song with your name, and it's your name, and it's your name, and a kickstart song with your name, and a sorrow to a song with your name. Hope you like a song with your name, and it, I'm holding it on to make your day with it. Over on you, ever stay with it, if you play guitar, you can play with it. How about a roll of the drum for Ether 101, and Timor nicknamed Limo. Who's behind that door? Why, it's Ingrid Ringford. Well, I'll be clicking a clack, it is also Jennifer Clicky.